Namaste. So now we have reached a critical point in the exposition of Sri Aparokshanubhuti. Remember the meaning of Aparokshanubhuti is a step-by-step -step process to reach the greatest of all, the greatest knowledge, the greatest realization, liberation, moksha, enlightenment, whatever you want to call it. And in this process, we have to go through several stages. One cannot just jump to the last stage because it's a step-by-step -step process. So now we're coming to the pivotal point in that process. And it's critical that we do not misunderstand. Let's take a look at the verses and you'll see what I'm talking about. There exists no other material cause of this phenomenal universe except Brahman. Hence, this whole universe is but Brahman and nothing else. From declarations of the Shruti, such as, All this is Atman, it follows that the idea of the pervaded and the pervading is illusory. This supreme truth being realized, where is the room for any distinction between the cause and the effect? Certainly, the Shruti has directly denied manifoldness in Brahman. The non-dual cause being an established fact, how could the phenomenal universe be different from it? Moreover, the Shruti has condemned the belief in variety in the words, the person who, being deceived by Maya, sees variety in this Brahman goes from death to to death. Pretty strong words. And that is because there are two classes of people who make grave errors in the process of self-realization. The dualists and the monists. Let me explain. The dualists, make they make the first mistake. They think that, oh, there's an irreconcilable gap between matter and spirit. And so matter can never understand spirit. Therefore, we simply have to be content with our material existence as separate individuals and perform religious rituals so that we have a nice life. Uh, this is the religious dualism that we see in the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And what it leads to is simply fighting over material assets and power. And no one is attaining self-realization. Everyone is trying to prove that they're the greatest in the material world. Because, of course, whoever is the greatest must have the mercy of God, right? <laughs> so this is one misunderstanding. This is the dualist error. Then there's the monist error. Well, everything is Brahman, so that means I am God, so I can do whatever I like. This is also known as Neo-Advaita. <laughs> I don't need any purification. I don't need to study. All I need to know is that it's all one. So, you know, cool, baby, let's party. <laughs> so th this is the opposite mistake. They're trying to jump up to the final realization without going through any of the stages beforehand. Why is this wrong? Because it means they have not shifted the context from, as we discussed last time, 
viewing the self as a spiritual being inhabiting a body which lives in a material world. They haven't changed the context. So they still think that, yes, I'm God, but I'm living in a body in the material world. So this is the wrong conclusion. The right conclusion is, I am Brahman, but I am covered by this material body and world, apparently. Actually, Brahman is never covered because all these apparent creations and all this apparent multiplicity of objects is simply an appearance. It is not actual. It's not real. It's Maya. But that's okay. It's still Brahman. But you see, the point of view now has changed. The context has changed. And so the meaning of everything changes. As soon as you have the view, I am a spiritual being, I am Brahman, and the body and the senses and the mind and the world, all this phenomena is within me. Then that puts you at cause over it. That means you create the meaning, you create the context. You control it, it doesn't control you. So this is where the Neo-Advaitans go wrong because they don't shift the context. And how do you shift the context? By sadhana. By first purifying the mind and body so that they are proper vehicles for self-realization and then developing discrimination. See, just like in the beginning, of Aparokshanubhutihi. There is quite a bit of discussion of the prerequisites, the qualifications for enlightenment. One should be calm and controlled. One should not be addicted to any harmful substances and so on and so on and so on. So only this kind of person can do the mental work required to shift the context. And how is that done? Through meditation, through sadhana. See, one has to uh, consciously change one's point of view from being in the material world to the material world being in oneself. I am Brahman. I am the self. I am one. Everything else that is apparently different is simply Maya. And since the phenomena of the material creation are caused by Brahman, are caused by me, actually, myself, Therefore, they are not different from me, but they are simply an appearance, not a reality, because they come and go. And even when they go, I remain unchanged, undivided. So the difference is in seeing oneself in the material body, in the material world, versus seeing the body and the material world in oneself and as a product of oneself. We are not a product of this world. Huh? There is no material combination that generates consciousness. Scientists haven't found it and they never will. The so-called artificial intelligence and uploading and all of this this is all a bunch of hooey. <laughs> they will never develop consciousness. 
They will never develop life. You will never be able to transfer your consciousness into a computer. It's all but just a fantasy. So try to understand. And simply declaring oneself to be God or to be Brahman and then going on with the same nonsense, that's not a solution. Yesterday, yesterday morning at the beach, uh, this young man came down and he was swimming very powerfully way out in the waves and all this you know, stuff that I used to do. And when he came back in, uh, I happened to be passing by and we had a conversation. And the conversation went something like this. Hi, hi. How are you doing? Good. Where are you from? And at this point, you know, as an expat in a foreign country in South Asia, you get asked this question so many times that after a while you just, you know, you want to throw up <laughs> every time you hear this, where are you from, you know? And, and this is an educated European guy asking me this question. So, you know, I become instant smartass when I hear this question. <laughs> I don't know how else to deal with it. So I asked him, what do you mean by you? And he said, huh? As if nobody ever questioned the meaning of the word you before in history. I said, well, a human being is not one thing, but according to the Buddha, a human being is, is an aggregate of many different parts. So when you say you, which of those parts are you referring to? The body, the mind, the consciousness, the ego? And go, what are you talking about, man? When you say, where are you from? That implies a past. But as far as I can tell, we're just here now. And he looked at me like, this guy is nuts. <laughs> and he said, well, uh, just give it whatever meaning you want. So immediately I knew he's a dummy because he cannot question his own assumptions. He cannot look into the structure of his communications and rephrase or reframe what he is saying according to how another person receives it. He cannot, in short, alter his point of view. He is stuck. Huh? Typical dumb jock. <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, they make good drummers, you know, they really do. But trying to talk anything intelligent with them is just like talking to a wall. You made the statement, where are you from? You had some meaning in mind, but all right, if you want me to assign the meaning, then I'll say, I am not from any place. I was never born and I will never die. I am everywhere. I am everything. And I'm only here now. There's no question of from. And he just looked at me like, whoa, what is this guy smoking? So I shrugged and walked on down the beach. But you see, this is the problem. To try to communicate with someone I mean, I probably could have had a very similar conversation with one of the tourists who comes to Tiruvannamalai to so-called study Advaita. You know, in fact, I've had similar conversations with them. In other words, their so-called study of yoga and Advaita has not changed their point of view at all. 
they're still in the same context, the materialistic context of I am a spiritual being in a material body in the world instead of I am a spiritual being and the body and the world are in me. Therefore, they fail in self-realization. They don't make the changes. They don't get to the point of liberation. And they miss the whole point of actual enlightenment. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum.